And our passage this morning that we'll be talking about, preaching through, is 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're again in this paragraph, beginning in verse 6, running through verse 10. And the title of our sermon, From Riches to Rags. From Riches to Rags. And this letter from Paul to Timothy, in this section in chapter 6, begins in verse 6 with this. Now, the, now godliness is contentment, uh, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now here in the context of this letter in Ephesus at the time, false teachers in Ephesus were turning from the pursuit of heavenly riches in Christ and now are pursuing this world's riches, which are nothing more than filthy rags by comparison. They are, by their teaching, by their example, by their life, leading others astray from the faith in their exploitation of them and teaching them to do the same. And it reminds me greatly of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel that gets preached today. That in their own lust, they seek worldly riches, teaching others to do the same and leading them away from the faith, leading them away from true riches in Christ, leading them away from the simplicity of the gospel and leading them on their way to drown in destruction and perdition. Do not be deceived by the enticement of wealth the enticement of riches, the enticement of abundance or having this world's goods. Build up for yourself treasure in heaven and be rich toward Christ. How foolish it is, and we'll see today, how deadly to go from heavenly riches, true gain in Christ, to worldly rags. And from last week, we began looking at point one on your notes, heavenly riches, that true gain, true riches are found only in Christ. Christ and Christ alone is the true treasure of the soul, only found in Christ. And that comes with godliness and contentment. Today, we're going to look at the contrast between heavenly riches now and point two on your notes, worldly rags. Worldly riches are really only filthy rags when compared with the excellence of knowing Christ. And then lastly, the hellish result, that there is an eternal poverty, an eternal penalty for turning your back on pursuing true riches in Christ Jesus our Lord. Turning your back on Christ is tantamount. It's like the dog returning, as Peter says, to eat its own vomit. It is the pig that returns to living and wallowing in its own filth. And so last week, we took a look first at heavenly riches. Paul explains in verse 5 that the false teachers in Ephesus, these Huckster, charlatan, sharks are exploiting the people to line their own pockets. They're getting wealthy off the people. They are the guy today that takes the tithe and buys a Learjet, takes the tithe and has the, the 10,000 square foot house on the beach. They're trying to line their own pockets with giving, the giving of God's people. They're exploiting them to get rich and they're teaching them to do the same. You need to be rich in the same way, teaching them to abandon the gospel, abandon faith in Christ. And they begin, he begins in verse 6 explaining that it is godliness with contentment that leads to great gain. And we looked at that from several different perspectives. The first was a spiritual perspective. Pursuing heavenly riches requires a spiritual perspective on riches, understanding what real gain is, what great gain is. And with a true spiritual perspective on riches, the things of this world grow strangely dim. They lose their luster because you have in your focus true riches in Christ. They just lose their luster. And I would not, as the poet says, change my blessed estate for all the world calls good or great. You are content. You are satisfied in Christ. Next from verse 6, we saw a Godward perspective. It comes with, uh, through godliness with contentment. These together represent what it means or what it looks like to be a child of the kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom. Godliness is Godward living, holy living. Contentment is Godward sufficiency, not self-sufficiency, but Christ-sufficiency, being sufficient, satisfied in Christ. Next, in order to pursue heavenly riches, we've got to have an eternal perspective. 
From verse 7, we look at this temporary world that we live in. We brought nothing into this world when we came into it, and it's certain we're going to carry nothing out with us. In other words, we have to get our eyes lifted up out of our temporary circumstances and place them on Christ, place them on our eternal inheritance, place them on our hope in heaven. We do that by looking forward with hope to our future eternal inheritance, which is rich in Christ. And then finally, we're to have a satisfied perspective. Verse 8, having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Christians are to simply accept what the Lord provides, be grateful for that, be content in that, and avoid covetousness. And again, this is the heart attitude of the Christian. Proverbs 30, verse 8 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, can the natural man attain to true godliness with contentment? Can the natural man lift his eyes above his own temporary circumstances and look on his life with a spiritual perspective, a Godward perspective, an eternal perspective, a satisfied perspective. No. These things are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. He's unable because they are spiritually discerned. You must be born again. If you find yourself in this trap, you find yourself on this downward progression of trusting in worldly riches, pursuing the trappings of this wicked world, you must repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ. You must be born again, born of God's spirit. You need to cry out to him, be merciful to me, the sinner, and turn to him by faith. Only God, only God can take the brute beast enslaved to his own lusts and make him a child of the kingdom. Only God. And only God does that through transforming the sinner. Cry out to God, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Are you sick of living as that dog who eats his own vomit? Are you acknowledging before God that you are unworthy to be a son? God, just make me a servant. And then God in his great mercy and in his great grace towards you makes you a son of the kingdom. You turn to God to be saved, to be born again. If you are far from Christ this morning, and I pray that the Lord would bring you to your senses, that you would see Everything that this far country has to offer is nothing more than the pig slop that it really is and that you would turn to Christ to pursue heavenly riches. We have eternal gain in heaven in Christ. And it is such a horrible, tragic, unimaginable contrast for people to deny Christ and seek after fleeting pleasures in this world. So last week we looked at point one, heavenly riches. Next, point two, worldly rags. Let's look at what this world has to offer. Worldly rags begins with verse nine. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now the question placed before you this morning is, will you pursue heavenly riches or are you going to go headlong after worldly rags? Your default position outside of Christ is you are just simply in the current of this world. You may think of yourself as rich, middle class, or poor, but if you're in the current of this world, you are enslaved to nothing more than the trinkets of this passing world, and you need Christ. You need to turn and flee worldly riches, worldly rags, and pursue heavenly rich riches. From this verse, verse 9, I want you to see three points here with respect to worldly rags. One, I want you to see a great contrast. Worldly riches are nothing compared to the hope we have in heaven. Worldly riches are nothing compared to gain we have in Christ. Secondly, there is a great collapse. The desire for these worldly rags will place you on a slippery slope, will put you on a path, a downward spiral that leads to hell, that leads to destruction and perdition. And point three, we're going to see a great and awful consequence. A great and awful consequence. So point one, let's look first at the great contrast. The main point of our entire text is powerfully communicated through the use of a contrast. And that's set up there by the word but, a contrasting word in verse 9. 
The contrast, you understand, puts you at a fork in the road. It puts you at a decision point, if you will, and it necessitates that you head to the right or head to the, to the left. How long will you falter between two opinions, the Bible says? Choose this day. If the Lord is God, then serve him. If Baal, then serve him. It puts you, the contrast, at a fork in the road. After demonstrating that godliness is profitable for all things, having promise, promise of the life that now is and promise for the life that is to come, and after instructing in verse 6 through 8 that godliness with contentment is truly a means of great gain and heavenly riches in Christ, Paul unveils to us in verse 9 the opposing path. This is the antithetical instruction we're talking about, and it is a powerful tool. If you'll allow the Spirit of God to pierce your heart with this, it is a powerful tool to help you see clearly your plight. There is a heaven. Antithetically, there is a hell. There are those who are false, and there are those who are true. There are the wheat, and there are the tares. There are the good fish, and there are the bad. There is a heavenly city, and there is a city of destruction. And there are heavenly riches and there are worldly rags. What path are you on? If you died this minute, where would you go? If the Lord took you now and you stand before him on judgment, in judgment, what would you say? What is your life going to amount to? Even now, you need to understand you are in the current of a great river. And today, you come in that river to a massive, granite, immovable boulder that divides the water around it on two sides. Which side will you take? Are you now, even now, being washed downstream and washed out by the current of this world, or are you being led along by the Spirit of God? Those who are led by the Spirit are His. If you have not the Spirit, you are none of His. What current are you being swept away by? Like God in Deuteronomy 30, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Paul here, is laying before us life and good, death and evil, blessings and cursings. And this is the pattern of Scripture. There is, if you will, in this contrast, in these antithetical positions, to steal a liberal term, a great, big, ugly ditch that separates the two. And you are on one side or on the other. Those who walk in light, contrasted from those who walk in darkness. There are those who are slaves of righteousness, slaves of Christ, and there are those who are slaves of their sin. There are those who have no righteousness of their own and plead for righteousness in Christ, and there are those who think of themselves as righteous and are righteous in their own sight. Those who are saved from those who are lost. There is wisdom of God and the wisdom of this world, and there are the wise and there are the foolish. And here there are those who strive after heavenly gain and those who follow the course of this foolish world after filthy rags. What about you this morning? You've been in this river. You are in the current. What about you this morning? Today, by God's grace, you hear the preaching of God's word and you are placed in the river again at the objecting granite stone. Which side will you be washed out on? Today, by God's grace, it brings you back to another rock in the river. You've passed by many boulders in your life. Do you continue to sweep by them in the current of this world, or will you turn to Christ by faith and allow the Spirit of God to sweep you the other side? Will you call to Him? Will you give all you are to all He is, the true treasure of your soul, or will you flow in the current of this world down into destruction and perdition. As Joshua said to the people, choose this day whom you'll serve. Or as Elijah, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If you falter long between two opinions, you'll be smashed against the granite boulder. You must choose Christ, pursue Christ, cry out to God. The contrast here in verse 9 is set on a hinge, set on its hinge, beginning with the word but. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. The word but beginning verse 9 alerts us to the contrast. It's not a contrast, mind you. It's not a contrast between the one who has the 25-foot boat and wants the 80-foot boat, okay? It's not a contrast between those who have the Ford and desire the Lexus. 
It's not a contrast between those who have the iPhone 4 and are willing to break their contract to get the, the iPhone 5S. This is not the contrast that the Lord sets up. The contrast, the but here, is between those who are content with the basic necessities of life and those who are not. So what are the basic necessities? Verse 8, and having food and clothing and an iPhone, with these we shall be content. <laughs> no, no. The godly, the godly see the Ford as a blessing from God way beyond the necessities. And they are immensely grateful to God for the Ford. It runs. It's not a Schwinn. It's going to get me to my job. Thank you, God, for my forward, right? It is discontentment. Discontentment that always wants something more, something new, something different, right? And it is discontentment that breeds covetousness and greed. Now, contrasted with the godly, described in verses 6 through 8, are those who desire worldly riches in verse 9. That word desire is a Greek word that communicates want or wish to prefer something. But this word, this word for desire here, also involves your will, involves your intentions, your resolve. It involves having a, pers a purpose and then intending to have it and resolving to get it, determining to get it. So their desire now, that desire with that purpose or that intention attached, here is for the purpose to be rich. That word to be rich is from a word that means to be filled. It's from a root word that means to be filled. And here specifically filled with goods, filled with possessions, filled with money, filled with this world's trappings. These folks in verse 9 have determined to pursue getting rich and they are following through with their resolve. This is communicating in verse 9 the sin of covetousness and greed. Now, this kind of volitional, intentional, or resolved desire that's listed here is great when it's turned toward the Lord. That's exactly the way that we should desire the Lord, with intention, with purpose. In desiring the Lord, we should, with resolve, pursue Him. Pursue the Lord. Pursue His Word. It's great when it's directed toward godliness with contentment. The word filled for riches here, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're to be filled with wisdom. We're to be full of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, back in verse 18, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, we are to be rich, filled in good works. We're to, be, we're to purpose to do them, and we're to be filled with them. Are you filled with good works this morning? Are you filled like that? However, this kind of purpose and intention for worldly rags, in verse 9 says, only leads to a snare and a trap. You will fill your intention, fill your purpose, fill your desire for worldly riches such that you pursue after the trappings of this world. It only leads to a snare, only leads to a trap. Here, the snare, the trap, is covetousness and greed. Covetousness, so you understand, is more than just a desire for money. It's the heart attitude of the person that bears the fruit of wanting and seeking and pursuing more. Out of the covetous heart flows sin. Out of the covetous heart flow violations of God's commands. Coveting property leads to stealing, doesn't it? In that sense, it leads to other sin. Rebellion against authority is coveting authority. So rebellion is impacted and influenced by covetousness. Coveting another man's wife leads to adultery in the heart. In that sense, it is almost always associated with discontent. The person becomes discontented in God's provision, discontented in God's sovereignty, discontented in God's providence over their lives, discontented with their circumstances, and because you're discontented with your circumstances, you're saying by default, you are discontented with God's plan for you, and in that sense, Colossians 3, covetousness is idolatry. This discontentment is a common characteristic of covetousness. Here in Ephesus, the common characteristic of false teachers is covetousness. It plagues the church. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter explains, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And he says in verse 2, the tragic 
consequence, many will follow their destructive ways. I think the, the covetousness of a pastor can lead God's people away. They can lead people into apostasy. It's tragic. Covetousness is a damning sin. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Sow your $100 seed and reap a $1,000 blessing. We'll take credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, wicked false teachers. Their judgment, the Bible says, has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. In addition to pastors, deacons are said in Scripture to be free from the love of money. They are to flee the love of money. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. So pastors are to be free from covetousness, not to be covet. Deacons are not to covet, to be free from greed. And here, completing the package, the author of Hebrews says that we're all to be free from the love of money. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. We have covetousness in the Ten Commandments. Does all this mean then that God condemns being wealthy? Although we are to be content with the basics, God does not condemn having possessions as long as it is God in His providence who provides them for you. Think about it this way. When you are truly content, truly content with the basics, then you can clearly and easily see provision for more as God's blessing. Remember our Ford. If you are truly content with the Ford, then if someone comes along and just gives you a Lexus, you can see, obviously and easily, that that's, just, that's just a blessing from God. God did that, right? If you are content with what you have, completely content, truly content, not pursuing or expecting or driving after more, then when God blesses you with more, you can easily see that as provision and blessing from God himself. And you can praise the Lord for it and be grateful to God for it. In that sense, contentment destroys covetousness. Contentment destroys greed. God warns us about these riches in, in Psalm 62, verse 10. Don't trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Don't set your heart on what you have. Set your heart on Christ. Be content with what you have and look to Christ. And if the Lord in his providence and in his provision decides to bless you with more, then praise God. What God condemns in the Bible is the greedy or covetous or selfish desire for money or possessions that arises from discontentment. John Wesley said this. Take this to heart. Listen. It is no more sinful to be rich than to be poor. But it is dangerous beyond expression. There's something about the human heart, something about our flesh that craves the security or the hope or the whatever that these world's riches provides. We won't put our faith in Christ, but we'll put our faith in our next paycheck. We'll put our faith in Christ, but we'll put our faith in that next car, that bigger house, that longer boat, that whatever. It is dangerous beyond expression. It is dangerous beyond expression because you have a heart that is desperately wicked, desperately deceitful above all things. And your heart, that enemy within your own chest, works with the enemy, our adversary, the devil, who works with the enemy, this world system that we're in, all to produce in you covetousness and greed for everything that this fleeting world has to offer. And it is so easy to be confused by this, so dangerous, so deadly, because it's so easy to be confused. Many see what God has provided for them, or they, what they, they have, they see what they have as God's provision for them rather than their own lust for foolish or harmful things or their own self-indulgent desire. They simply see the things that they've had, that they've lusted for. They would admit that that's God's provision for them when in reality it's nothing more than a product of their own lust. They say, look at how God has blessed me, yet it's put them in a financial bind. Is that a blessing from God? No. Uh, what they call a blessing is a foolish lust. 
It's the blinding and binding lie of materialism, covetousness, and greed. Remember our Ford. Being immensely grateful for the Ford breeds contentment with the Ford. Contentment with the Ford destroys any discontentment with the Ford. Guarding yourself from discontentment with the Ford blocks sinful desires from worldly rags. Contentment guards against sinful desire, which guards against temptation, which guards against the trap of sin, which leads to drowning and destruction and, destruction and perdition. Contentment. Those that desire riches actually think often that they are rich. But look at what God promises. Listen again to the contrast. Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. If your delight is in God, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Does that mean that if I delight in the Lord, he'll give me that Lexus? <laughs> no. Praise be to God that when God causes you by his spirit to be born again, he changes your desires. My desire, God, is to please you. Lord, to, to rid myself of this wicked sin, to follow you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, to inherit Christ. And he gives you the desire of your heart. Your desires change when you're in the Lord, praise God. Psalm 34.10 says, Those that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. That requires that your definition of what a good thing is changes. And praise the Lord, when you're in Christ, your definition of what a good thing is changes. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Speaking of spiritual riches here, heavenly gain. Speaking of Christ. Why do you spend money, Isaiah says, for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. You can have empty rabbit ear pockets with not two pennies in there to rub together, but if you have Christ, you are in abundance. You can have your bank account chock full and be impoverished apart from him. If you insist on pursuing worldly rags, this great contrast between Christ and this world's riches. If you decide to pursue those worldly rags, then these worldly rags cause you to fall into a temptation and a trap. Now with this word fall, point two, I want you to see next on your notes a great collapse. A fall into temptation and a trap. Verse nine, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Paul says that they fall here. This is a great collapse, a great downward progression. This verb, empipto, communicates a continuous falling. It's the pattern of your life to fall. You're just falling, falling, falling into temptation as a result of this sinful, covetous desire. If your contentment isn't in Christ, if your sufficiency isn't in the Lord, if you're not pursuing godliness with content contentment, then you are predisposed to the falling. As the temptation comes, you fall. The next one comes, you're just a lackey, you fall again. The next temptation comes, you fall again. If you are not in Christ, you are predisposed to this continuous collapse in your life. You must look to Christ. And this is a, a terrible progression. Listen to this. One, they begin by desiring the wrong thing. They desire worldly riches. Worldly rags rather than heavenly riches. Two, they persist in that sinful pattern. And the Bible says persisting in that sinful pattern. Deuteronomy 32, their foot will slip in due time. Their calamity is at hand. They lose their footing and they fall into temptation. And they fall and they fall and they fall. Three, giving in to that temptation over and over and over again. They find themselves in a snare, in a trap in foolish and devastating lusts. And fourth, they, tra they are trapped in their lust and they are plunged after that into ruin and hell. When you are trusting in these worldly rags, when you are being satisfied with the things of this world rather than with Christ, then when temptation comes along, you are predisposed to a fall. You're predisposed, you will 
You have no strength in and of yourself to defend yourself against these things. You need the Spirit of God in you. And you will fall and you will fall and you will fall. The Christian, you fall and you fall, you end up becoming ensnared to this sin, dulled to it. Your conscience becomes seared. You have to trust in the Spirit of God. Look to faith in Christ and cry out to God to rip you from that condition. The snare here in verse 7 describes something that fastens or holds fast. The snare here is used uh, as a word in the, the Old Testament to, to describe the seductive woman. It's a seductress. One definition of snare is that which causes one to be suddenly endangered or unexpectedly brought under the control of a hostile force. Now, there was an Elvis song. Elvis, you know, I remember, most of you don't remember Elvis. I'm old enough to remember Elvis. He says, I'm caught in a trap. I can't walk out. Why could he not walk out? Because I love you too much, baby, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> He's caught in a trap. He can't walk out. Why? Because I love you too much, baby. That, that's covetousness. That's greed. I've got my mind on that car. I'm caught in a trap. <laughs> can't walk out. It is a snare. It is a trap. Those things which you desire will bring up before your eyes Count on it. You can guarantee it will bring before you the baited hook. You take the temptation in your desire and you fall. You fall into a snare. You fall into a trap and you can't walk out because I love you too much, baby. <laughs> what is ultimately the love or desire is that which traps. And often it is a love of self that puts you in that position. You're trapped by your own hand. Look at an example of this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn there with me, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And look down beginning in verse 11. And consider this progression. Consider this downgrade, this slippery slope. Hear what the word of the Lord has to say to us. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Beware, God says, that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. We are to beware. We're to obey the Lord. Verse 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and a thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. The wickedness of the human heart to deny God. Listen, we are in a day and age where we are wealthy beyond imagination compared with those who went before us in centuries long ago. We have every resource, every pleasure, every leisure at our disposal. Those poorest among us are rich by the world's standards. You have everything. You've built beautiful houses and you dwell in them. You have clothes and you have food. You have built up for yourselves treasures on earth. We have all these pleasures and leisures. And the express danger of that, as Wesley said, is that we begin to trust in them and we look away from the Lord and look to them. We say, ultimately, by my hand and in the power of my strength have I gained all these riches. We forget the Lord. We remember the Lord. When you fall into that trap, you become enslaved to many dim-witted and harmful, destructive longings, many senseless and vicious passions, many stupid and injurious desires. Desire for worldly riches opens up a Pandora's box of evil and harmful and destructive lusts. And all of this is self-inflicted. All of this damage is done by your own hand. Do you sense yourself on a, on a downgrade? 
can be so deceptive at this world's riches. Do you perceive yourself on a retreat from the godliness that you once delighted in? Has something replaced Christ as the treasure of your soul? Take dramatic, immediate, and drastic action. Cry out to God, Lord, help now. God, grant me the repentance which leads to life. Grant, God, that I should turn from this sin and turn to you in faith. Otherwise, according to verse 9, these sinful desires are those which drown men in destruction and perdition. What a, what a contrast, right? What a devastating and amazing contrast between the two. This temporary life that you're here living, just living for yourself, living according to your own lusts, indulging yourself in the trappings of this world that will lead you to hell in a moment's notice. And Christ, the treasure of all eternity, the treasure of the universe, the treasure of your soul. A, an amazing contrast. The infant gain, the infinite gain of your soul in Christ or the infinite loss of your soul in hell. A glaring contrast. Repent of your covetousness. If you don't repent of your covetousness, it will be the millstone that is hung around your neck that drowns you in destruction and perdition. Let me give you another example of this progression, this downgrade. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. This progression. And listen, the farther you are down the progression, the more precarious your position. The closer you get to the precipice, Turn from your sin and trust Christ, James chapter 1. Any step on that slope is a slippery step. Beginning in verse 9, and listen to the parallels here. So many parallels. Verse 9, let the lowly brother, the humble brother, glory in his exaltation. The Lord says that he exalts the humble. He casts down the proud. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself now before his word and repent of sin. The rich will glory in his humiliation because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. Your life on this earth is but a vapor. Turn to Christ. So the rich man, he says, also will fade away in his pursuits. We come into this world with nothing, and we're going to leave with nothing. And in a moment, it'll all be gone. Trust Christ. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who endures temptation. Don't be lured away by this world's riches. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But listen to the progression. But each one is tempted. Here's this baited hook, right? Here's this concealed trap. He is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You see the baited hook and you want it. These are hunting and fishing terms. Uh, these are enticement terms. You see the temptation and you desire it and you grab the hook. Verse 15, then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It all leads to death. That's why it's such a foolish, foolish and harmful decision to pursue this world's gain. Now, this brings forth death, leads us to our final point. We looked at the great gain of heavenly riches. We saw the contrast between those and worldly rags. And next, point three, we must be warned by the hellish result. Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money... That desire for riches is the baited hook. It's the concealed trap. It is the sinking ship. Certainly, and most obvious, this baited hook refers to covetousness, to greed, to materialism. 
But it also here refers to miserliness, hoarding up for yourself riches, saving all you can. You see your brother in need? I'll be warm to be filled, brother. You hoard your wealth, miserliness, sinfully saving or holding on to wealth. Being a root of evil, this root of evil produces fruit after its own kind. Wicked men who sin in accord with their wicked hearts that are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and pursue after worldly riches produces after their own kind. And these worldly riches are those for which, it says in verse 10, some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. In this clause, in the Greek, greediness is pushed all the way to the front of the clause for emphasis. It's as if Paul is saying, for greediness, some have strayed from the faith. Can you believe it? There's Christ, and yet there is Christ. Greediness have led some astray from the faith. It is an absurd transaction a foolish and harmful lust that people are led astray for greediness. This life is passing away. Stray from the faith is another way to say that they have been drowned in ruin and in hell. Now, there are Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 teach there's no coming back from apostasy. If you give yourself, after having come to a knowledge of the truth, you sin willfully after worldly riches and give yourself to that pursuit and you abandon the pursuit of Christ, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10 says there's no coming back. There's no longer a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. This is a tragic, disgusting, catastrophic, appalling, dreadful, heart-rending and heart-breaking contrast. Do you see it? Those who have turned aside from the glorious promises of God in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now are craving after worldly rags instead. To their damnation, they crave it. It is so tragic that they've done this. That verse 10 says, they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And they don't even see it now. You'll see it one day. Listen, these sorrows are only those that are completely and fully realized, completely and fully experienced, completely and fully felt by those who are in hell. You think you have sorrow now? Just wait. Feel the, the complete sorrow in hell. This is a bitter wound of the heart, a bitter wound. By giving in to the deceptions of this world, they drive a stake through their own heart. The word means they're pierced, impaled. By their own hand, by their own doing, they impale themselves on the wickedness of this world, on the desire for riches, impaling themselves on their own fleshly lusts, many sorrows, a deep grief of soul. Let me ask you this morning, will you persist in the pursuit of the things of this world? Will you persist in the pursuit of the desires of your wicked heart, the lusts of your fallen flesh? Will you suffer the piercing of your own heart the piercing of your own soul for an eternity in hell, chasing after the fleeting wealth of this world? You don't have to. You can repent of that sin now. You can turn from living for yourself now. You can pour contempt on the desires of your flesh right now. Pour contempt on your pride Pour contempt on your covetousness. Pour contempt on your greed. Pour contempt on your rebellion. You can do it right now. Just repent. Turn from your sin. Hate even the garment defiled by the flesh. And turn to Christ. There's one who suffered just such a piercing so that you could be free. He suffered such a piercing so that you could be saved. From the prophet Zechariah, I tell you now, look on him whom they've pierced. Look on him whom you have pierced with your sin. You might as well have been there at Calvary, driving in the nails yourself. Mourn for him. Your sin is responsible for his death. Mourn for him that he has been pierced through with the punishment that you deserve that you deserve. 
and grieve as one grieves, Zechariah says, for the loss of his son. Cry out to God, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And God is rich in mercy. He is abounding in loving kindness towards you. And he is a rewarder with heavenly treasure of those that diligently seek him. And Christ says to me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you sick of eating your own vomit in this wicked world? Sick of living in the mire? Lift your eyes to Christ. Lift your eyes to the heavenly city and live for him. Put yourself. God will put you on that path if you'll repent. God will sustain you and preserve you and cleanse you and forgive you and give you a heavenly inheritance. Christ says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. The way of the transgressor is hard. There's peace in Christ. Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus Christ is the only and true treasure of the soul. The human heart will never ultimately be satisfied with worldly riches, with her, which are really just human filthy rags. The human heart is in need of the new birth, is in need of a transformation. And in that transformation, the human heart finds its greatest need, finds its greatest hope, its greatest joy, its greatest security, its greatest purpose, its greatest satisfaction, and its great, greatest treasure in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you. Praise be to you, Lord, for your unspeakable grace, for this wonderful gift of salvation. God, we are so easily ensnared, God, so easily trapped by the enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. God, protect your people, Lord, from this wicked trap, from this slippery slope. Lord, preserve them by your grace in Christ. Guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to look on heavenly riches in Christ as everything to us such that we are willing to give everything we are to everything that he is. And God, if there's someone here who is on this slope, who is running in the current of this world, God, I pray that you would crush them against that granite boulder in their river, and bring them to acknowledge their hopelessness apart from Christ and save their soul for your glory. God, lift their eyes out of the mire of this world and place them by faith in Christ on their heavenly inheritance, their hope. Save them, Lord. We love you and we thank you, God, for this great salvation that we have in Christ. I pray that we would apply the truths of the Scripture such that we may live for you wholeheartedly, God, and persevere to the end. In Jesus' name, amen.